All right, assuming we're recording, welcome everybody to the latest uh, workshop that we're doing through the California Library Association Ursula Meyer Advocacy Fund Training. And if you can memorize all that, that'll be on the midterm, you'll be ready for it. If you're watching the archive version, you are realizing that there's a big slide, maybe a bunch of little faces off to the side here. This slide is our introduction that we put up so that when people look at the archive version, they know what we're about. So this is about the only period of 30 seconds of silence that you're going to get. I'll stop long enough for you to look at this. And I'm gonna take that down and then we're gonna hand it over to Dorothy and we're running with it. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, don't don't go yet, Dorothy. Let, go let yet? The slide go. Okay. Yeah, I just want people to see that. Gotcha. It's, that. Very pretty. Go. <laughs> it's a very pretty slide, Paul. Oh, thank you. I've worked on I mean, You know, it's the old oh, problem. Way too much text, but we got a lot to say there. I'm hoping that if people need more time, they'll simply freeze the archive version and look at it. So with that in mind, obvious things to catch there are. It's an ongoing series. You can catch stuff on YouTube. We put our events up as quickly as we schedule them, so you can always check back at the California Library Association site. And if you love what we're doing, and we hope you do, and you want to support us, there is a way to donate to the programs. Uh, that's down at the bottom. You see the link there. Give us your pennies, your dollars, your life insurance. But no, I'm just kidding there. Whatever you want to do to support us is, is tremendously appreciated. There goes the slide. I see the recording button is working. In this particular series, we don't believe in wasting a lot of time telling you where the bathrooms are. You already know that because you're working from home. So Dorothy, why don't you jump in and get us started with a story that you think captured the topic that we're running with today? Uh, thank you, Paul. And thank you, Karen. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, I observed how a friend in her role as a library advocate expressed the dignity of human intelligence. She gave voice to what can't give voice to on its own. That is the wisdom found in our library stacks. In a conversation she had with an education partner, she emphasized how people can discover positivity at the library and pointed out that the library offers a treasure trove of books and resources. And I'd like to add the example of, the, of Socrates. Socrates emphasize the importance of leading the exam in life, and I call it library in reach. Uh, it's a little play on, you know, the phrase library outreach. And in reach is striving to bring out our inner best and the best of others. And Socrates encourages us to learn to use universal concepts like dignity and goodwill to bring out our best self. So we're going to start with this question. Uh, how can I better express dignity in my advocacy work? And I'm defining dignity, dignity using um, the Proto-Indo-European language root uh, uh, to show honor and to be gracious. So I uh, wondered, Paul, if you could put in um, the question in the chat. How yeah, grab, can it, I... grab that and get that. In the meantime, anybody who wants to respond, feel free to either... Uh, put it in the chat, or better yet, put your camera on, uh, turn on your audio, and respond to Dorothy so we get a real conversation going here. Yeah, so we're pondering, how can I better express dignity in my advocacy work? Lots of answers so far, right? Okay, here comes the question <laughs> back in the chat. Alexandra's got her hand up. Why don't we, let's go for it, Alexandra. Can Can you hear me? Beautifully. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, I haven't used the web camera at this computer before. Um, I think that's a really great question. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure of the answer. Um. I think it's really hard because often in in library work we're so service oriented. So you know you're you're thinking putting. I mean not to like big up ourselves, but you know put put whoever you're working with first. But I I think with you know taking a minute to kind of center with like your own personal beliefs and and um just kind of like your core can maybe maybe help, especially if you're in like a tough tough situation. 
So um, you can help uh, uh, give the training today. So thank you. <laughs> that was wonderful. Anybody else? I was, may, maybe I'm reading the question wrong on this. Um, I, I believe advocate through example rather than speaking on that. And in Biblioteca, in uh, the branch library that I work at in San Jose, we're near large unhoused populations, as a lot, a lot of libraries are having situations with that. And something uh, stupid easy that I do that other other openers for some reason don't is we have kind of a we have kind of a dual set of doors. I call it an airlock on that where we have an outer cage area. It's a tunnel um, before you actually come to the library lobby and both get closed. So I kind of, on days when it's hot, on days when it's cold, on days when it's rainy, um, I just open up the the, the airlock area. They're, they're not allowed in the library until we actually open the library at 10 a.m. But uh, a little bit of dry, uh, a little bit of conversation with each other, conversation with me, I'll go out and talk with them in the hallways. And it just provides a little bit of, a, you're human. Let's have, you know, treat with human dignity on that. So maybe I misread the question, but that's that's my definition of dignity on that. And um, always when we first open the door, the first place they run to is the restrooms <laughs> on that. So yeah, that's that's just how I see it. And I'm trying to advocate this to my coworkers of 99% are harmless. Let's open it up on that and and see how it goes. Occasionally, you're going to have your one sleeping near the doors, sleeping in the in the alleyways. Um, you know, let's welcome them into the library. We also have on Thursdays at my branch. This is an external person comes in for quote unquote coffee and conversation, and it's more social outreach um, on that. She's a social services worker in our library, but also seeing the dignity that she treats people with and the compassion and you're not going to get signups for her social services immediately, but I've noticed over the course of six months, people are engaging more, coming more to her events and starting to take advantage of her services. So we need to realize it's not going to be an immediate impact. It's going to take time. That's yeah, true. That really resonates with me. I was in a situation where I was supporting an organization for the longest time and we'd have evening events occasionally. I remember one night, many, many years after it happened, still resonates with me that I was outside in the fog, in the cold here in San Francisco, knowing the person that was organizing it knew we were all out waiting, but he wasn't going to open the doors till it was time to start. And we all knew he was having his dinner in there, not the image we wanted. I love that you've defined dignity through inclusion and through empathy. That goes so far. Yeah, really, really well. Great example, Trevor. Thank um, you. One of the uh, uh, examples that I have a uh, little bit different. Uh, there's a New York Times bestselling author, Regina Calcaterra, and she grew up homeless on Long Island. She became a lawyer, elected official, uh, as well as an advocate for the homeless. Uh, she had a mentally ill mother who would leave the children, there were five of them, for very long periods of time. They had to sleep in cars. They would break into abandoned houses without that did not have electricity or running water. But Regina put in her um, biography of her memoirs that she used the public library. And yeah. not only for the basics of AC, heat, bathroom, et cetera, but she said it was a place to read quietly as a kid and be inspired to create a better life. And I had the opportunity to meet her. And, and so I interviewed her and she said that each moment of kindness from many caring adults, including librarians, even though uh, teachers would spend more time with her and her siblings uh, you know, during the, the school day, but librarians were important too for that moment of kindness. And she said all of that added up and help create her self-worth, determination, and a sense of dignity. So um, the role of the advocate is designed, I think, to connect with that inspirational attribute of dignity. Uh, by pondering dignity and exploring how it can be applied, we get a hint of its power in daily life. And 
Um, you you all are living it and, and gave some really great examples of that. Uh, we may not see immediate res results, um, like the example of uh, a homeless child on Long Island growing up and becoming very successful. Not every that doesn't happen for everybody, but there are often results that are um, that we don't see that are beneficial to our patrons. So uh, thanks so much for that. Um, most human beings do not use much of their brain power. And Nikola Tesla, as we know, is the electrical engineer and inventor, is an example of a great use of the mind. And I've done some research on him. And I would describe him as a discoverer of principles, which continue to be explored today. He was a hundred years ahead of his time. He uh, focused on electric power, motors, radio, radar, wireless capability, robotics, and drones. And this is back in the late um, 1800s and early 1900s. So he really is a model for what the human mind can do. And he mastered the skill of discernment. So discernment can be defined as the ability to discover what is utilizing the human mind to make the discovery. So we have, and we have potential to do so much. Libraries can help draw out the genius in everyone who's walking through our doors. So the library, of course, is filled with enormous treasures and we offer books, resources. Um, we offer a lot for relaxation and escape, uh, which is tremendously valuable for rejuven rejuvenating ourselves. But uh, and I know some people check out books for research, uh, for challenging themselves, uh, but not all of them do. So I just want to make the point that walking into the library can be an act of discovery and discernment. And an example there is uh, Janali Cobb. He is a New Yorker magazine writer, and uh, he grew up in Queens. I used to work for the Queens Library. Uh, and his local branch, the Hollis branch, was some a place that he realized and was always amazed that he could check out anything he wanted. And he got a, a biography of uh, Thomas Edison. And in it, Edison was described as a kid who read like a stack of books every week. So Cobb set that as a goal for himself as a young child. So of course it helped him with you know, becoming a writer, but exploring and discovering uh, viewpoints and outlooks, uh, uh, you know, across the, the whole gamut. Um, so part of the librarian's role is to be an ambassador of what's there, what we have in our library. And then at the same time, we don't want to simply keep adding information into our mind. So I'd like to make a, a little point about unlearning and how important that is as well. So there's this uh, saying by uh, the Greek philosopher Heraclitus, knowing many things does not teach insight. Uh, the author of Expect the Unexpected, Roger Von Eck, uh, says, I think what Heraclitus is getting at is this, forgetting what we know at the appropriate time can be an important means for gaining insight. Without the ability to forget, our minds remain cluttered with ready-made answers and we're not motivated to ask the questions that lead our thinking to new ideas. So uh, with that, we're gonna do a little conversation activity uh, on Mentimeter, but it's around you know, the core value uh, that I grew up in library land with, and that is we're each responsible for our own learning. And I think my library at the time had gotten, um, I had acquired that from Peter Senge, uh, who uh, is about the learning organization. And he started out helping a lot of businesses and companies with that. So I'm going to share my screen here. And... Uh, Bring this up. Oh, I need that paper, baby. Do you want another coloring sheet? 
I'll take Christina, it. I think I'll we're read. getting your conversation in the background there. If you don't mind muting um, until you're ready to add to the conversation, that would be really helpful. Thanks. And let me do this again here. Here we go. All right. And share screen. Up we go. And so you can see on here, there is uh, a QR code if you want to hold your phone up. Paul's putting has put in the chat the link if you just want to go there. The first question is, what are you learning from your community? I think to piggyback on my previous answer, empathy is okay. what I learned from um, the users on that, which users aren't always the same as the community on that. And that's probably a different topic. And um, my community, my community, I'm learning, um, maybe this is a little selfish here, but I'm learning a lot more Spanish language <laughs> from my community on that. My Spanglish has improved greatly to the point now where I can help um, without needing translation on that, as long as it's slowly and keep to the core account issues, self checkout issues, uh, things like that. If they want information assistance, if they if it turns into a reference check, then it's completely all all bets off. <laughs> well, that that's pretty impressive, and that that's you know very valuable responding to your community. Bravo, bravo. And I see that uh, some of the responses on the Mentimeter, um, serving starts with listening, it's fantastic. I learn something different from uh, people in the community each day. They appreciate the opportunity to influence our offerings. Now that's super key to, it's, it's listening and it is responding uh, to help shape our services. So we're providing something that uh, the community wants and needs. I'm learning what's important to them and what is not, so we can more effectively collaborate to produce positive results. Excellent. I've learned the depth of their commitment to the library. That's very cool. Being able to market resources of the library to the community is really important to make sure their needs are being met. Very good. And to ask what they need before I form an idea of how I want to help them. Oh, that's, that's, uh, please uh, uh, chime in and, and help uh, run this course. That's fantastic. All of, the, all of these are wonderful. All right. Um, and uh, let's see. I'm listening and realizing that I am not the best person to hear their needs, so I collaborate with others, maybe with more similar experience to them so that they can have a safe space to share. Now, that's fantastic. So you really are uh, hearing their needs, uh, but it's through a team, through help. Uh, I learned what access obstacles exist. Very good. So what I'm going to do now is go to the next question. Thank you so much for that. And this one, you can read it either way. Uh, who can you turn to for inspiration? Maybe somebody in your community, maybe somebody that uh, is uh, somebody that you've read, uh, you appreciate that way, somebody in your personal life. Jane Goodall. My partner is a master naturalist, and uh, Jane Goodall is high up on her inspiration. Uh, the Ursula Meyer advocacy team. Yay. My grandma, Mr. Rogers. Oh, that's fantastic. Yes. I had the good fortune of going to the uh, Rogers Education Center in Western Pennsylvania, which is where I'm originally from and spending some time doing some archival work. So that was that was wonderful. Colleagues locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally, Zoom and other online communication tools are incredibly helpful, super. The library community and my coworkers, absolutely our peers, 
my mother who has been stitching her community together sometimes for repair with her bare hands for as long as I've known her. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, my mother who also worked in libraries, very cool, keeping it in the family. I'm inspired by the young people in our community. Excellent, excellent. And I have on the, uh, the image there, Helen Keller is one of my inspirations. Well, thank you so much for that. We're going to go to our third question on this Mentimeter, our third and final one. And here we go. How can you best serve your community in ways that help, as they say, all boats rise? So I know this is morning time in California, so we're really trying to get the the mind muscle going. You know, Dorothy, that our mind muscles stop by noon, so you've got about another 90 minutes or so. <laughs> For me, empathy is the key. Listen, think, respond, and act. Oh, beautifully said, beautifully said. Understanding to enlist others in meeting community need, outreach, ask questions, and listen to different groups, what their needs and interests are. It's great. Sometimes making sure you are personally doing okay so you can continue to be there to serve others. That's great. And we'll get into some of that in a bit. Decide what is important and focus on that, those priorities. And we're going to get into um, some of that a little bit. In my community, I see some success with initiatives like, uh, not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, cafecitas or uh, promotorias, groups that are informal and have language access for people to help them get services. Yes, we had uh, different learning cafes uh, in the library where I worked for a number of years. And um, some were in English, some were in Spanish. Um, very, very helpful for, for different communities within our, our uh, larger community. Uh, definitely working with the community to see what they really want. It's so key. Get others involved and excited. Give respect and responsibility. Lead by example and be open, openly excited for the work myself. I love that making sure everything possible is accessible uh, to everyone. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you for that. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen here. And uh, let's see what else we have here. Um, now, just a couple of comments. We can work intelligently with our inner best self to determine how to enrich the circumstances around us. And you guys were all getting at that. Um, so instead of just reacting to uh, our community, we can uh, work to respond in thoughtful ways. Uh, we can draw on optimism to grasp both an awareness of a problem and the understanding of solutions at the same time. And when we apply our intelligence, it can help us be responsible for our own learning. We're all responsible for our own learning. And being open-minded, adaptable, and flexible can all help with that. So it helps us to steadily seek and expand our scope of insights and understanding and to use hope and celebration, as we all know. I um, watched a colleague over the years, uh, an outreach librarian, Denise, and she some of her key responsibilities were taking after school activities to the Boys and Girls Club. She drove the bookmobile. Uh, she offered uh, various workshops for families and parents. And she was always open to learning. And when we went through several years ago, the need to really focus in on new and emerging technology and the Ozobots and the virtual reality, augmented reality, all those things, that was not comfortable for her. It was not her personal interest. 
but she really became a master learner and um, was able to develop the skill for all of those kinds of um, little technology pieces and, and take them to the Boys and Girls Club and really learn with the students as well. So uh, she promoted the love of learning. She promoted what the library could offer, what we could bring out to people. Um, she became a media mentor for uh, parents and, and families, uh, really focusing in on helping them make their own wise decisions around media literacy, digital navigation, tech learning type activities. So she was, I think, a great example of a steadfast advocate for connecting people to the library and lifelong learning, and also promoting the idea to learn, to help people learn to think for themselves and make their own decisions. So uh, this kind of leads us into the libraries having core values. And I have been part of organizations where the love of learning, innovation and creativity, embracing change have been key values. And they really help to sculpt our mind, if you will, how we were our outlook on our work. Uh, it helped to establish an inner foundation of strength for the staff and as a team. Uh, so even if, um, you know, emotionally, I was, it didn't matter if I was sad or happy, irritated or calm or whatever, those were something, those were like a go-to. Well, I'm supposed to be embracing change, you know, let me, let me focus in on that. So um, in my research, I found that values are something that we can treasure, cultivate, and watch over. And we may, we don't really have to think about them all the time or have long conversations about them, but it is good from time to time to reflect on them. And um, it's what we wanna put our time, energy and effort into having a nice set of core values and um, uh, using them as a foundation for our work. So it really helps us with the work at hand on a daily basis. And just a couple other examples of these core values that some of the organizations I've seen use, intelligent risk-taking, not just risk-taking, but thoughtful, think through completely and thoroughly kind of intelligent risk-taking there so that it's not, not everything is a high risk, you know, you, you want it to be moderate or low risk, but intelligent uh, risk-taking is the key. Uh, appreciating quality and embracing humor, of course. Um, I had a, um, a colleague who was so good at the knack of using humor to help uh, lighten up a conversation in a tense discussion meeting uh, or um, bring light to um, uh, a problem or something we were trying to face, you know, publicly with a challenge or what have you. Um, and she, and, and also her watching her infuse this humor really help to heal situations. It, it was helping to move us forward and, and beyond you know, a crisis or a turning point or that sort of thing. So just to kind of um, wrap this up where each employee is responsible for their own learning, uh, that kind of philosophy and, and these kind of key values, core values that libraries can have, can connect staff members to the library's purpose to support human growth. Um, Socrates has, a, part of his philosophy is leading the exam in life, as I had mentioned. And what I'd like to do now is just talk a little bit about sort of using great thinkers as our peers. So as we read and, and study, you know, poetry and, and essays and so on, whether it's Plato or Emerson or, uh, you know, Nikola Tesla, uh, JFK, whoever, uh, we want to get on the same wavelength as these great thinkers. So, uh, Paul, if you could put in um, this uh, reading the writings and philosophy of great thinkers, it can do two things for us nourish and refresh our mind, 
with inspiration to return to a more calm and creative state of mind as needed. It can also nourish and refresh our emotions by renewing them with a full charge of love, benevolence, and joy. And I'd like to read the last stanza of a Ralph Waldo Emerson poem. Emerson was known more for essays, but he was also a poet. And this poem was called Music. So just the last stanza here. Tis not in the high stars alone, nor in the cup of budding flowers, nor in the red breast's mellow tone, nor in the bow that smiles in the showers, but in the mud and scum of things, there always, always something sings. So Emerson is reminding us there is always something good that can come out of every situation. So here's, here's the next question. And Paul, if you could put that in the chat. Um, do you have an example of using courage, calmness, or cheerfulness to enrich a situation? Could be advocacy, just could be your daily work, either something you've done or you observed a colleague or, uh, you know, just anything around um, courage and calmness in action. And this isn't a time to be shy about the good things you're doing. <laughs> um, I've, I've found that honestly, just having a kind of upbeat, cheerful attitude can really make a difference um, across like just kind of a bunch of different situations. But, you know, even something as simple as just always saying hi to someone, either like a a colleague or a regular that you see um, that can really build up over time and kind of create relationships. Yeah. Well said, very well said. I, I remember in college, there was a um, an instructor and I started using humor where we just had this thing of uh, trying to tap the back of the, our knee, his knee when he walked by and he tried to do the same. And so no matter what was going on in the day, that always cheered, cheered us up, you know? So, but um, yeah, that upbeat uh, foundational attitude is fantastic. Anybody else? Not exactly in the library, but outside the library. When I'm on the, uh, the customer side of the transaction, on that when things are done and actually I've done this in the libraries as on the customer side of the transaction when things are done instead of a thank you or a welcome or a have a nice day I always end with stay awesome just to let them know they're awesome and continue being awesome on that their reaction is usually surprise on that but that always gives me a little bit of a kick and makes makes me go about my day a little bit happier the same way Alexandra said about you know cheer, cheerfulness cheerfulness in the library um People aren't always happy when they come to the library. It's a happy place, as, as my shirt attests to on that. But um, people aren't always happy, and they need help, and they need information, and they're looking for it. So give it to them, always uh, unbiased and with a cheerful smile on that goes a long way. Greetings go a long way on that. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, Dorothy, I think back to some of the people we've had on this series over the last few years, and one of them that comes to mind is the director of the Redwood City Library, Derek Wolfbram. Derek, to me embodies what you're talking about and courage and calmness. When we talked about book banning, book challenges last fall, he described to us the experience of knowing that the Proud Boys were going to show up at his library to disrupt, a, I think it was a drag queen story time. He got the word ahead of time they were coming. So rather than panic or get into a tizzy over it, Derek met them in the parking lot. And he spent an hour and a half with them, listening mm -hmm. to them, explaining library policies, explaining what they were all about. I believe Derek walked away saying nobody's going to change their minds, but just the exchange and the the respect shown, the integrity, as you the word you used earlier, the integrity shown and listening to them and saying, here's what we're doing. Tell me about what you're doing is the embodiment of what I think we're all trying to strive for. And I just admire the heck out of him. And I hope he's not listening to this because I would be embarrassed that he heard me say this. 
Love Derek. (laughs) Wonderful example. Um, So library advocates can be described, and I I would, what all you, you are adding here, really, you are champions of enlightening humanity. Uh, How can libraries offer programs that will inspire, spark curiosity? And I would add even startle, but this is not the kind of shock startle. This is to startle in the sense that the sky's the limit for what the library can do and how to respond to a community. So we can be experimenters, collaborators, and advocates of all things library. Let's startle ourselves and the people we serve. And I think... uh, Paul, your example is a great one of this. Startle them with common sense, our respect for others, and our ability to celebrate all that's good in our community. We may not agree with everything, but we love our community and want to try to serve it. So to to kind of finish up with these core values, and we're each responsible for our own learning and unlearning, uh, I To me, that core value cannot be overstated. And just to give you a little, you know, history of libraries, Benjamin Franklin established a library company way back in 1731 in Philadelphia. It was called it library company, but it was more encouraging book lending beyond his small group of friends. Andrew Carnegie in the late 19th and 20th century Uh, donated millions of dollars, it would have been billions of dollars in today's dollar, to build libraries in 1,600 communities across the United States. The larger goal of these two geniuses who were staunch book lovers was to stimulate thinking in the local community, like we're all trying to do, and and to stimulate thinking in a broad way, you know, for humanity. We're trying to to enlighten and and, uh, uh, help the growth of humanity. So a tool to help us sift through ideas and to determine, I think somebody mentioned what will work, what will not, what doesn't work, uh, is a great little tool by Edward de Bono, and it's called the Six Thinking Hats. You may know it. I'm going to share the Mentimeter again, and we're going to go through Uh, this challenge, and it is um, uh, uh, sorry, it is the um, uh, how can how can I find the right balance between too many projects and not enough time? Now, what I want to do is um, first give you a little background on Edward de Bono. He died in 2021. Uh, He was 88 years old. He was born on the Mediterranean island of Malta, grew up there. Uh, He coined a term called lateral thinking. And um, I would say the way that process is, we might refer to it as thinking outside the box. Uh, He wrote over 60 books. Uh, He did a lot of work uh, in Europe with CEOs. He taught Nobel Prize laureates. He had a television show in London for the BBC uh, for children and students at one point. Uh, He himself was nominated for a Nobel Prize in economics. So, and he also, you know, taught at Oxford and Cambridge, England, and also had a faculty appointment at at Harvard in the United States. The uh, journal Psychology Today said, we owe de Bono a debt for constantly reminding us that thinking is a skill and can be improved. And people say, well, you know, why why the hats? You've thir- heard of the uh, saying, you know, put on your thinking cap. Well, I think that's what de Bono had in mind. And he uses hats with different colors uh, to make it easy to talk about thinking processes and then to focus on one at a time. And, the, and of course, caps are easy to take on and take off. Um, so uh, we're going to uh, give you, oh, you already put in the PDF of, of the, uh, the hats. I'd like to review them real quickly. The white hat represents objective information and knowledge and asks how are we going to get that knowledge? The red hat elicits feelings, mood, and intuition 
to be most effective with the red hat. It helps to keep our answers short and without justification. So for example, I don't like this project or I'm really excited about this. Uh, the yellow hat is the logical positive and you look for possible opportunities, benefits and rewards. The black hat, which is often the most important hat is the logical troubleshooting. And it asks why a proposal might not work if a project is successful. It asks what are the risks and obstacles that need to be overcome? Little example there, a CEO of a chocolate company, a candy company uh, had taken the Six Thinking Hats course and commented that um, there was a chocolate bar project that they they had that um, she said needed good black hat thinking. They developed the product, conducted a marketing survey, received a lot of positive feedback, but with the rollout, what they hadn't anticipated that the chocolate bar was so popular and in such demand, they did not have the production capability to keep up. So she said, no one asked, what is the risk if we are successful? The green hat helps us find new creative ideas. It seeks to remove obstacles and reduce risks identified in black hat thinking. The blue hat is the control hat and it's one to manage the thinking process. It gives an overview and summary. And I like to add an orange hat uh, that I look at as helping us uplift our thinking. It draws on the capacity of creative intelligence to organize ideas and projects. And each of us have all of these thinking abilities. This technique really nurtures and draws out all those different kinds of thinking processes uh, for each of us. So I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen and we can get started here with our Mentimeter. So the first question here, and these are timed because that's what makes this work and you don't overthink things. So the first question, what knowledge do I need and how do I get it to find the right balance between too many projects, not enough time? And we have one minute and I'm gonna time us. So if you could put that in the Mentimeter or in the chat, that would be great. These are great. Speaking directly with possible participants as well as supervisors and so on to figure out priorities. Wonderful. Try to shift from reacting to creating. Excellent. Using peak performance hours. That's so great. Yep. Those are my times too um, for deliverables rest of the day for being proactive. Um, understanding the skill set and availability of my team. Superb. Um, what goals are trying, what are the goals we are trying to achieve? Excellent question. Help prioritizing guidance on what projects are most important at this time, the committed needs, library trends, gaps in services. So it's evaluation ongoing for sure. Time management skills, goal setting capabilities and understanding of goals and objectives as a way of creating a productive roadmap. Very good. Make sure to ask for help when needed, even when it's hard. Beautiful. All right. Now, next here, our next question is the um, yellow hat. What are all the possible advantages in solving this challenge? And, all, <laughs> and we have one and a half minutes to 
figure out all the possible advantages, but it, it's the idea of trying to think big. So one and a half minutes. No, you got a question in the chat, which challenge are we trying to solve here? Oh, it is the, um, uh, how to balance, how to find the right balance of too many projects, not enough time. Thanks. Sure, thank you. These are great. Productivity, actually getting things done instead of just thinking about it. Better experience for everyone, time to be more thoughtful and less scattered, stressed out. It helps us set emotional boundaries. Better able to focus and achieve key goals, maintaining mental health and energy, better outcomes. Better understanding of your own workflow and how to work with your strengths and limitations is fabulous. Better time management gives us a sense of control rather than chaos, relaxes us enough to produce positive, enjoyable results. It's excellent. Improve time management skills, gaining other advocates on your team, improve camaraderie, fabulous. All right, so the next hat is the black hat. And the question there is, what are the risks if I solve this challenge? So if we're able to have the right balance between too many projects, not enough time, what are some risks there? And we have, uh, two minutes for this one. And you can also think of this one as, what are the risks um, involved and any obstacles involved? Ah, that's a good one allowing less urgent matters to go unattended. <laughs> that, this next one is very key. You might get more projects put on your plate. So it, it, it is definitely uh, one of the risks there. People will be happy in their work and never retire. That's wonderful. Uh, called on to perform other similar tasks causing increased stress. Yeah, I once had a, a boss say, um, it seems that to get things done, you give very busy people the extra projects. <laughs> like a, conflicting ideas of what projects should be prioritized, leading to people feeling undervalued or that their time skills have been wasted. Very good. Needing to get buy-in on the key goals. Yes. Um, okay, we have tongue-in-cheek response. If we solve the challenge of effectively managing our time, we might not have anything to do. Oh, <laughs> the horror. I, I always like to think, too, that we'll discover more things that the community would want the library to do, you know. I'm, I'm not so sure that's tongue in cheek, though, because uh, at least in the private sector, if you come in under budget, they're going to slash your budget the next year and you come in under budget again. And it's a perpetual thing on that. So it is kind of a legitimate fear. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I do agree very much so. Um, Let me assure you that in libraries, that's not an issue. Tongue in cheek? <laughs> no, the idea of not having anything to do. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's kind of open ended. Yeah. Still trying to get my first librarian job. Still trying to figure that one out. Yeah. Careful what you ask for, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you should have no trouble 
retiring as a librarian, I think. Um, here's another one. You don't overextend, you don't want to overextend yourself. Maybe there really isn't time for everything. Excellent point. Uh, downsizing by administration, if you can handle this workload, surely it can be done by a smaller team. And, and these are all excellent points. So we're going to go on to the green hat, which is where we can <laughs> grapple with some of these uh, risks, obstacles, concerns, fears uh, with the green hat thinking. And the question here is, what new approaches and ideas can we generate to reduce these concerns, risks, and to overcome these obstacles. So what new ideas, fresh approaches can we think on? And we have one and a half minute to do that. Surveys. Yes, involve community in determining priorities, beautiful. I would love to delegate to an advisory board, excellent. Oh, that's key, know when to ask for help and that it's okay to ask for help, yep. Discuss with coworkers. Beautiful, the team approach. Clearly outline and loudly celebrate what we are doing with the freed up time. It's great. Volunteers with the skill sets needed. Excellent. Recognize and embrace the idea that we really cannot do it all. So setting priorities and staying focused is an essential approach. Well said. Okay, I think we can go on here. I think our time's just about up here. So the next hat uh, is the blue hat. And the question there is, how should we think about this challenge? Is there something we need to learn first to meet this challenge? So we have a minute for this. Anything we need to learn, anything sort of in a framework of how we want to put this challenge, too many projects, not enough time. Ah, I'm only one person, but also I am one person, <laughs> beautiful. One of the things for this one that when I first focused on uh, this particular challenge was even if I had like a legal size pad of paper with, you know, 25 things that I think I should have be doing that particular day, I would try to chunk it down and um, maybe work on the top seven or eight for the next few days, but then choose just three for that day. So that was something that had helped me chunking it down. What method works best for you based on how your brain works? Excellent. Ours and others limitations, very important to assess. One thing to learn quickly is how to say no without simply being contrary or obstructionist. Very good. No can be framed in a way that offers other options rather than serving as a complete shutdown. Well said, be unafraid to say no. Uh, there was a period of time when it was very popular in my career to always say yes, always try to find a way to say yes. So there's value in that, but um, it did create the need <laughs> to, to answer this challenge. How do you handle too many projects and not enough time? Because everything was just added on, added on, added on. 
Um, Jose, keep... I'd love to jump in with yeah. an example of how how to take this no in a way that's effective for a project. I was working on something that was a four-year project, the volunteer thing here in my own neighborhood, and it really was a large-scale project. About a year into it, somebody in the neighborhood came along as a newbie on the block and said, well, instead of doing that, why don't we do this? And had all kinds of suggestions for how to change it. And my quick answer was, we're a year into a four-year project. I like what you're saying. It's a nice idea, but that's a different project. And I would encourage you to go do that if you want to. And he disappeared. That was the end. Yes. So, so easy. Yes, yes, yes. Well said. Yeah. We want your help, uh, but uh, here's the, the framework of what we're doing now. Yes. Uh, keep healthy to meet the challenges of the day. Sleep and diet matters for clear thinking. Absolutely. Uh, is governing board open to change? Um and uh, ask yourself uh, if the workload is reasonable within your job description and work hours, especially if you're the kind of person who doesn't like to say no to request. Well said. If I could just add to something Paul mentioned, um, I've noticed a lot of people or just, you know, some people are really strong in generating ideas, but they have little interest in staffing their ideas. They like to give their ideas to other people to staff. And so I really like um, Paul's strategy for kind of empowering people to move forward on on their visions, maybe on their own, <laughs> or, or at least without you who has a full plate. Yeah, well said. And um, I have a colleague uh, in Maryland who uh, sort of runs her shop that way. Uh, that it's important to come up with new ideas, but to own those ideas if you want them to go forward. Yes. Right. Let's see. We have uh, the red hat next. And this one is looking broad again. What inspires me to solve this challenge? And we're just going to do this for a minute. These are all wonderful results, happy, healthy, thriving communities, survival. If I don't effectively manage my time, I'm not very productive or useful to those I serve. Well said. Creating a healthier work environment for all of our staff. Excellent. Not wanting to feel inundated or behind and take time to recenter on why you love what you do. For me, it's remembering positive reactions to past projects. Excellent. It is. And somebody was mentioning how important it is to celebrate. So the last hat we have here is um, how can I draw on creative intelligence to organize priorities and find the right balance between too many projects, not enough time, and we have a minute for that. Be confident and find ways to communicate how important this is. Excellent. For me, it's the concept of wisdom of the crowd. If we have the right people around us and listen to them, we are much stronger than we could ever be on our own. I think there were some very smart people who... Um, whose philosophy was that, that you work so much better as a team creatively. 
get advice from people in, in other roles, even other fields, excellent. Is there similar projects in the past that can be used to reduce time? That's excellent. Don't forget to utilize the resources your own library offers. Super. I try to work with the seasons, hard to explain, but there are times for growth and time for reflection and yeah, the rhythms of life. Um, it is hard to be creative when you are stressed. So my first step is to relax and have fun. Approach the project when I am ready. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for that. And I'm going to stop sharing here. And um, to, uh, to just uh, say that as we're promoting these big ideas of compassion and goodwill and wisdom, it is really helping us do our daily work in very profound ways. And, and we're really advancing our understanding, the community's understanding, humanity's understanding of, you know, the whole range of cultural arts, business, technology, science, etc. cetera. Uh, libraries can nourish our ability to thrive uh, in all of our communities. Now for the next part, we're gonna focus just a little bit on three of the big ideas of Plato. So we have goodwill, life's abundance and serenity. And uh, goodwill can be defined as the life force that unites humanity. Express daily, goodwill sharpens our skills of tolerance and forgiveness. We can recognize the abundance of qualities and sources within ourselves. And it's all of those wisdom, love, joy, strength, we can express these qualities, helping us not only endure, but to thrive. And then in regard to serenity and trying to focus in on the calmness, we can learn to focus on the higher levels of thought to center on the energy of serenity and calmness. And of course that can then help us tap the hope that we need, the insights that we need, the courage we need to do our work. So here's a question, and um, uh, Paul, if you could put that in uh, the chat, it is, what are my best advocacy qualities? What do I bring to the advocacy table? So if you want to open your mic or just in the chat. I have found through trial and error that I'm a pretty good salesman on that. I am, I'm effective at getting people on board and, and moving towards the goal uh, on that, on that, as long as I myself believe in the goal on, on that was my thing uh, is kind of the caveat with it, with that. I think we are all, we all are, or we all can be, as long as you be have belief in it. Well said, well said. I know I rely on humor a lot, but I think it really does come down to empathy in a lot of situations, um, both the the willingness and ability to sit down and listen to what people are struggling with, what they're aspiring for. And that process alone also kind of gets gets buy-in from them. They, they are more willing to engage with with the work and you get more involvement from the community if they feel like they have a hand in it. Yeah. Very well said. Uh, some nice things coming into the chat. Commitment to supporting a healthy workload for staff. Excellent. Uh, and Paul saying, as long as I myself believe in the goal, it's all about integrity, sincerity, and passion. And Amy, thank you. I have been cultivating the ability to listen and observe, still working on these skills as we all are, I'm sure. Um, and Alexandra, reinterpreting things from library speak into something the average person can understand. We do tend to get into uh, lingo a bit. And Amrit, uh, being approachable is key. Um, Antigone would have loved that. Yes, thank you. Um, 
All right. Uh, and I'd like to just talk for a moment here um, about a tendency by some of us in the library world to wonder what more we might have done in a particular situation. It's always helpful to ask those questions of what worked, what could have we done differently to be more effective? What did we learn from this? Uh, but it's also important to be able to faithfully express, to know that we, we faithfully express as much wisdom, goodwill, and harmony that we were able to tap in that particular moment, that we recognize the value that we've been able to accomplish a lot. Uh, so by expressing universal concepts, harmony, goodwill, patience, unity, et cetera, uh, we create a moment to help us move forward, to help the library move forward under any circumstance. And there was an old philosopher, I don't know who it was, it seemed like many people said this, but uh, so I don't know who the original was, but we can complain because rose bushes have thorns or we can rejoice because thorn bushes have roses. Uh, so we're gonna go out to our final um, Mentimeter here and I'll share. And here we go. So the we have two questions here. The first one is name a successful experience that you know I have had as an advocate uh, for my library. So name a successful uh, experience as an advocate. building a community of professionals who show up for one another beyond each individual. Excellent. With the, I remember back when the internet um, really became a, a public resource there was seemed to be so much hope around the idea of building a sense of community. And um, we've done a lot, um, but there's more to be done. So well said. Asking people with relevant skills if they would be interested in working on a project they did and, uh, and to bring friends, excellent. Meeting with a partner organization interested in a new project and letting them know we can't take all, all of it on, but we'd be happy to help with one piece. That's uh, very well said. Um, sitting in on uh, community meetings, um, I um, would raise my hand to say, library could do this, you know, I could help the group write this grant or you know whatever it was but expressing what i felt was doable and never promising uh that the library would do more than than what i knew it could or what i would be participating in uh let's see um doing library outreach at the local middle school with my manager um to talk about our weekly music program and i can't oh here we go let me put that away. There we go. Uh, in July, we brought drums and a trombone that we played and let any interested students play. Oh, that's wonderful. There was a program in, I think it was in Wisconsin, where uh, an outreach activity uh, that the uh, one of the libraries had was um, everybody learned to play the trombone. So I think that was fabulous. Recruiting volunteers who augmented what the library was able to offer. Excellent. 
building the literacy program, bringing new volunteers and learners and developing services like citizenship, commu computer literacy and conversation groups, wonderful. So we have one more question here. Now, what quality or qualities helped you succeed in that particular situation, that particular project? Perseverance, empathy, and passion, persistence, quickly creating distance from those who do not support my vision to create space for those who do. Ooh, that's a good one. Excellent. Enthusiasm, passion, focus, determination. Communication style, excellent. Being willing to put the word out and get over the fear of rejection. There is a question that I sometimes ask about how can we sustain our work even if we're not getting any encouragement or any feedback, you know, on a regular basis and uh, uh, whether our role as advocate or our role as a librarian, there are colleagues in many situations that don't have that kind of uh, support. And uh, confidence, courage, empathy, commitment, a willingness to engage with others and not care how we look during our middle school outreach about our weekly music program in July. We played along to the song uh, Happy by Beryl Williams. That's wonderful. Not afraid to play the fool now and then, right? Excellent. All right. I'm going to stop sharing here. And uh, uh, just a, a, a focus a little bit here that, uh, you know, my two cents is that to help people, we must first learn to care for them, no matter if they are a humanitarian or not. Uh, the skill of self-renewal, transforming and thriving can help us as advocates. We can be poised to make our services meaningful to our users, no matter the background or starting point of uh, those arriving at the library. And again, reading the works of profound thinkers and doers, uh, you know, we find them in our collections, can inspire us to look at things from the point of view other than one's own. So this next activity, we're just going to open the mic or do it in chat, is called Plus Minus Interesting. And it's another one designed by Edward de Bono. And uh, Paul, if you could put in the uh, scenario for this. Uh, every library employee studies Plato's dialogues. And they do this together as a bi-monthly course with guided conversations. So that's our scenario. And the first question is, what are the good things about this idea? Don't worry, we'll get to the bad things, but right now we wanna spend a few minutes looking at what are the good things about this idea? Learning together, build community and common knowledge. Excellent. I love the idea of all of us doing something together regularly. It builds friendship and team spirit, encourages synergy and critical thinking, builds a community, a community of learning. Plus we get paid to read, <laughs> wonderful. Learning new perspectives. Fantastic. So our next question oh, creates a space for other conversations and group activities, encourages respect and understanding of others' view, others' viewpoints. Excellent. So the next question is, what are the bad things about this idea?
to have a study group of Plato's dialogues meeting regularly? Or what don't you like about this idea? And avoid tribal knowledge and siloed thinking. That was a good one. Thank you, Trevor. Plato may not be accessible to everyone, act too academic. Plato sounds like a tough read and maybe feels like one more thing to do. People might not have background knowledge on philosophy, might not be interested, interesting for the group. What else don't we like about this idea? Not contrasted with more modern context, information, problems, community, could lead to sort of uh, navel gazing in a vacuum from application. Anything else? Well, our last question on this is, neither good nor bad, what do you find interesting about this idea? Okay. Uh, no time creates additional work for staff who have to cover for others. And that was a uh, a bad thing about the idea. Well said, Heather. <laughs> so, neither good nor bad. What is interesting about this idea? Plato is foundational knowledge that many other concepts and theories are built from could lead to re revelations on how other works are inspired. A topic people might not expect. I would be curious how it would impact the group and services. Expansion of knowledge and understanding. I like the idea of bringing a theoretical framework to things, plus it could be fun. Bringing people together in this way can expand horizons overall and make connections. It's new, supports learning and development of new thinking skills, would lead to interesting discussions and new connections among staff. It creates a somewhat different venue for interacting with colleagues and possibly building rapport so different conversations down the road are a bit easier to have because there is a level of trust and familiarity among group members. Well, that was just absolutely beautiful. Thank you all so much. Um, the Another tool that we're all familiar with on some level or another is uh, sort of that universal, the golden rule of treating others the way one would be uh, like to be treated. So a keynote to this golden rule is acting with respect. And this skill can help fo focus us on calming reassurance, um, staying above the fray, uh, and it can boost our ability to think and respond in helpful ways. So uh, here's a question that we can ponder at the beginning of each of our days. Um, what good can I do today to advance my common sense approach to advocacy? And then we can end the day with what good did I do today to add value to my approach to advocacy. And we can train ourselves and others to recognize, discover, and discern how to nurture ourselves and those we serve. We can enhance our organization and the communities we serve with confidence and add a higher level of joy to our advocacy. So uh, with that, just wanted to open it up for questions. Um, and comments or just uh, other discussion points. Um, this has been a wonderful, wonderful group. Thank you so much for participating.
And I will be sending out some resources, uh, Karen, so that you can pass that along, um, including the links that were in the chat for De Bono. There will be something for Roger Von Eck. Um, he wrote, probably heard, a whack on the side of the head, expect the unexpected, uh, the creative contrarian, sources like that. Um, so I'll, I'll have some stuff that I'll send out. Okay. Yeah, there's there's a quick list. I would like everybody to have that finished by 1130. You had about eight minutes. That should be enough, right? <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Dorothy, I want to jump in here, if, um, not taking away the last part of question and answers, but something that I think is really important for all of us as activists and learners is to ask ourselves, what do we get out of this and what transformation are we experiencing as a result of the time we spent with Dorothy? So pop in the question of any of you that want to answer it. What will you do differently in the next week because of your participation in this conversation? And what will you do differently in the next week because you were part of this conversation? Um, I I think I, I really appreciated all of the different uh, strategies. And, and I think, you know, taking the time to have a kind of like multi-step process with your thinking and not just kind of like being like, oh, no, and having to go with the first thing, but being like, how can I look at this from a couple different angles and kind of even even just writing it down is is very, very helpful doing like a little brainstorm. So I think, yeah, I really like that. If for those of us to facilitate learning, that is so wonderful. I wrote things down. It's so good. The other trick is to make the time in the next few hours to go back and read a couple of those notes so you don't lose them. amrit has got a really great one in there in the chat and the things are jumping. So she says, I will mainly have to reflect on what everyone has shared, which is, again, something we don't do often enough. We, we work. And then we have this illusion that we step away from work and we do something like this. And then we go back to work. In fact, we know we really are doing this right. This is part of our job. We are excited about this. It makes us better advocates and better learners. So what Amrit has thrown out there about reflecting on it is the next step for us actually applying it. And I also want to point out Amrit's part of the uh, Ursula Meyer committee that oversees the whole project. So if you like what you heard from her, get in touch with her or get in touch with me. Let us know you want to get involved. We're always looking for new topics, new pers perspectives, and new presenters. And that comes in all kinds of ways. Dorothy and I met over lunch at an ALA conference six months ago, and that's what led to this. Other presenters have come through by being here. Amrit got on the committee because she came to the three pilot projects that we ran about three years ago and was just so dynamic in what she presented. We're all going, how do we get her in? How do we get her in? And it led us to say, we need you on the committee. So in our case, we were lucky she didn't say no. Let's see what other things we have in here about people, what they're going to do, think and discuss priorities and focus energy on projects that have the most impact. Tony's saying, make sure I'm thinking about everyone involved in projects with empathy and not just keep hammering out emails and expecting results immediately. Trevor's added in talk and listen with a colleague on a different level. I try to do that every day, Trevor. Not successfully, mind you, but great, great one to have there. Amy says, a reminder of how important it is to take care of ourselves, be able to help others. Remember, that's what we were bringing together here. We covered a lot. And I just, my hat's off to, to Dorothy for a couple of reasons, just the scope and breadth of her knowledge but also her ability to, to come in and bring so many things that apply to us as advocates, as well as other parts of our lives, how to nourish, how to thrive. Good time for me to, again, plug her book. I put this in the chat. She's got several out, but the one drawing for today's session was Transform and Thrive, Ideas to Invigorate Your Library and Your Community. She wrote that with uh, Gail Griffith, James Kelly, Buffy Smith, and Lynn Wheeler. So if you want to go further into what she was talking about today, that's a good starting point to get more into what Dorothy is doing. Dorothy, you want to put your website into the chat also so people have that? Uh, sure. Yeah. I, th I think you did earlier, but here we go. And I'm reach coming back with this is an inspiring space. And please do join us. Absolutely. And Erica has to go. But thanks for the webinar. You're welcome. Those of you watching the recorded version, let us know what you think and what, what we need to be doing to better meet your needs, too. It's an ongoing project. California Library Association is dedicated to making this a learning space for all levels of staff and all levels of the library community in California. So well, our doors are open. We'd love to have you walk through those doors and be part of what we do. Dorothy, any kind of a wrap you want to do with all that you threw out, what are one or two of the big takeaways you hope people got today? Um, I would say that, um, you know, I talked a little bit about 
you know, I called it the in-reach role. And it is that ability to um, um, think about, you know, how can we examine what worked, what do doesn't work, uh, focus in on the dignity uh, essential for our work as advocates. And um, I would say express the best within and draw out the best of others. It may be challenging, and it is also doable. The more we try to do this, any worthwhile effort brings us forward or takes us forward and to be able to be our best and bring that to the workplace on a practical basis. Thank you. For those of you headed toward the annual ALA conference at the end of this month, June of 2024, just in case somebody's watching this in 2027, uh, we will, M. Reitz, Dorothy Doyle, uh, Deborah Doyle, I'm sorry, Deborah Doyle and I will be doing a day long pre conference workshop on Friday. Um, you're welcome to attend. We've still got space in that for you, or just look us up before or after the session so we can continue the conversation. And I'll be in the CLA booth on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday mornings, I think from nine to 11. So if you want to continue the conversation, come on by. We will also be in Pasadena for the California Library Association conference in October, again, doing a pre conference workshop on advocacy basics along with many, many other topics. And we just hope you come in and, and add to the, the wisdom that we have. Other questions before we say good day? Or even comments? Very helpful, thank you. Thank you. All right, well, we'll give you a gift of time. We've got two minutes to go. No more questions. What we'll do is as soon as I give Karen the signal, she'll stop the recording. Dorothy and I stay for a few more minutes in case any of you have questions you did not want to ask in front of a live camera, zooming you out there to the universe. But good day. We'll see you in July and August and September and all the other months we do these things. Second Wednesday of the month, 10 a.m. Check out the YouTube channel for the videos. Have a wonderful day. And that, with that, Karen, you can go ahead and cut the recording.